Eric. Good afternoon. How you going? I'm doing so well. How are you, my friend? It's so good to be back. It's, yeah, just awesome to be back. And if you are on YouTube, hello, how you going? Um, so if you've been around here for a little while, you'll know very well that episode 54 was a bit of a clusterfuck um, where uh, the the penance for me, this is very apt given the work that you do, Eric, the penance for me, um, uh, waking up very early on a Saturday morning to coordinate uh, Craig, my friend in Wellington, uh, and Eric's time zone there in LA, um, meant that I got up at what we call Sparrow's Fart um, and very early on a Saturday morning and pretty much couldn't remember my name, um, let alone <laughs> host a conversation. And it's a fantastic conversation, but I forgot to press record uh, for the chat. Um, so oh. it's now redemption. So Eric, <laughs> we're back. Off. Pressure's off. You yeah. can just like dribble. You could say absolutely. You could speak shit. Uh, and... You know, it's interesting. I don't know why, but for some reason, when I am hosting my own podcast, I feel a little more on edge. Is not the right word. I don't feel on edge, but I feel a little more like like pressure right but when i'm the guest and someone else is like even now like i'm leaning back i'm kicking back hey i'm just a guest in your home this is your this is your court i just get to watch <laughs> exactly <You just laughs> and get say to whatever i want <laughs> show up say smart things uh have an enormous mug oh my god isn't that great that's these lovely. are my colors here look at this i found this at a hotel that I was staying at for uh, a con for coaching conference, and it happens to match all of my colors. These uh, these are my colors for my logo and my program, yeah. and it just literally matches perfect. Because if you're not on YouTube right now, you got to go on YouTube and check out how awesome my <laughs> mug and my mouse pad are. If you're a nerd at color coordination like me, um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, uh, I haven't pressed record on this yet. Um, oh, so, <laughs> you haven't? So, no, no, not on the not on the audio because you know, like. You know, this is the special treat that people on YouTube get to see. Um, uh, oh, good, good, good. Kind okay. Of stuff. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I have okay. to say, I don't know, like this is not something I, I widely um, uh, sort of telegraph, but I'm colorblind um, and or like red, green, color confused. Um, so what do you see when I hold this up? Um, well, I see, I think that's like red, yellow, white around the sun, there's like a couple of shades of green and gray. Um, this is kind of a trick question because, yeah, these are like teal, which are like some people say blue, some people say green. I say they're somewhere in the middle, probably closer to green. But yes, and that's like a an orangish red. So I'm gonna give you a I'm gonna give you a pass on that. Thanks. I think you did good. So um, I don't know if you like like if you viewer if you have a look at my like the colors on Instagram um, that I use. Uh, my partner, Jeff, he has a uh, design background um, and uses color all the time. And he has picked out those colors for me. And I know that I can use them in any combination. They don't clash. I'm not going to be giving people seizures or migraines um, <laughs> because they look fine to me. Uh, and then um, there's a color wheel on Canva as well that you can pick a color put the color into the color wheel and it gives you like complementary or opposite colors or, or whatever like that. So I'm like good technology to the rescue because otherwise it is foolproof. Yeah. We yeah. don't discriminate here at Canva. No, <laughs> no, no, exactly. So yeah. Foolproof, fill proof. Uh, yeah. Same, same. All right. Eric, you good to go? I'm so good. All right. I'm going to press record on here. There are red numbers, so that means it's good. Eric Feltes, welcome back to Connection Over Coffee. How are you going? Oh my God, how how apropos I have my giant mug of coffee right now. I know. As we're discussing things like shame over coffee. What a, what a delightful topic to talk about over coffee, is it not? It, it is, it is. And I have to say, listener um, on, on the podcast, uh, the viewer on YouTube now can see... Well, I really want to say a coffee mug that blocks out the sun so much so that, that it has a sun on it, uh, like yeah. little rays of sunshine. But this is possibly 
the biggest coffee mug that I have seen for a very <laughs> long time. Um, and those of you who are not in North America um, will probably appreciate this. It's like an American sized cup of coffee for an American really is. coffee. Yeah. But I will say it's not about the size of the cup. It's about the, con- <laughs> it's about the contents and how you drink it. Exactly. One of the things <laughs> like I could I could go on for ages, got to stop myself. But, you know, traveling in America, trying to get a coffee. Um, and here, like if you're Australian, if you're a Kiwi, you will appreciate what I'm about to say. Uh, I, I My coffee is a long black, which kind of sounds phallic. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's flat white, there's long black, short black, um, all these kind of like, you know, and, and it's an Italian style, but it's like, uh, two shots of coffee with a little bit of water on top. Um, and it's just like the bee's knees. It's awesome. Um, I tried to get something similar to that uh, in the US and each and every time. And this is from like coffee shops. Like this is not like Starbucks. This is what I, you know, they sell artisanal bread at these places kind of thing. And I just stopped asking I just started eating, uh, eating drinking espressos because I'm like you just can't stuff that up like if you can make an espresso you can put a bit of water on top of it you've got a long black um but uh, we, yeah. we um we are very stuck in our ways here in America yeah well we you know like you know it's just when in Rome but uh yeah sometimes I just need like that heart starter um for uh for for a day of uh of driving or whatever but Eric coffee receptacles and coffee conversations aside, which yes. ironically is connection over coffee. It's lovely to have you back. Welcome back. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me back. And in case someone hasn't watched what, no, sorry, they couldn't watch, um, but hadn't listened to episode 54, where you and I had a conversation with uh, with my friend Craig Watson over in Wellington um, about his experience of growing up Christian and gay. Just in case someone hasn't listened to that, um, and I mean, just no listener, but if you haven't listened to to it, I'm judging you right now. Yeah. What? Um, no, sh- no shame, though. No, no, no. Sh- no I'm, I'm shamelessly judging you. There we go. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, Eric, who are you? How'd you get to be here right now? Oh, man. There's so many ways this conversation could go. How did I? What is the meaning of life, Phil? Um, <laughs> how did I get to be here with my giant mug of coffee uh, on Zoom halfway around the world from you in this moment talking yeah. about shame? Yeah. Uh, in 1987. No. Um, so I, I grew up Catholic and evangelical. And I, you know since puberty knew that I was different than the other boys. And once I was old enough to recognize what made me different than the other boys, uh, you know, AKA that I'm gay. I knew that I didn't want to do that or be that. I always, particularly in the evangelical church I went to starting in uh, ninth grade, I always knew it was wrong or knew. I was, you know, believed I was a part of the cult of innocence. I believed that it was wrong. And, um, and I also believe that God can change you. I believed in miracles. Uh, I still believe in miracles. My you know, definition of that has shifted a little bit, or my idea of what a miracle is has shifted. But I believed that I could be changed. And so I would pray at night, God, change me, God, change me, God, change me. And um, I had I had moments where I thought I wasn't gay. <laughs> and uh, I dated girls and uh, was engaged to a woman in my mid-20s. I was with her for five years. And then I cheated on her with a guy, and that's when I recognized, oh, this is not something I can just sweep under a rug. And it was the first man that I met that I didn't just want to have sex with, but I also wanted I wanted to hold his hand. I wanted to kiss him. I wanted to be romantic with him. I felt very much in love with him, and that was a different sensation. So that was the first time where it wasn't just sexual. It was also romantic and, and uh, vulnerable. Called off the wedding. I cheated on, on my fiancé with this man, and then which I very much regret. Well, I don't say I regret it, but I'm not proud of it. Mm. 
And through that, I recognize that being gay is not wrong, but that this cheating is wrong. I'm living a double life. I never want to do that again. I want to be authentic. I want to be one whole person in every room I walk into with integrity intact. And so I came out of the closet that, you know, save the dates were already out six months before the wedding. So call the wedding off. Everyone knew in my life, knew that I was gay, knew the wedding was off, knew I was gay. And that was a lot of pressure at that time, um, but also a big relief. That was a while ago. Um, mm. Fast forwarding a little bit, I, I through a lot of hard work, I got to the place where I don't just tolerate being gay, which I did for a while. I came mm. out and went made a lot of mistakes. I was a people pleaser and a perfectionist and... I was worried about what other people were thinking. And there was this voice in my head, like what if being gay is wrong and all of the things that we hear and one by one kind of knocked those towers of shame down. And now today, fast forwarding, I don't tolerate being gay. I love and celebrate it. And I recognize it's a gift. Um, I have decided and chosen to reclaim Christianity as my own. I have recognized that the more I love myself and being gay, the more I feel seen and loved by my higher power. Um, I, I use these words very carefully. That's that's my choice. That's my journey. Some of my clients, which I'll, I'll get to what I do, but some of my clients go back to church. Some never want to step inside a church again. Um, more power to them. My job is to empower their journeys and to help them to love themselves, not tell them what to do. Yeah. I'm not an evangelical anymore. I'm not going to press my agenda onto them. If Christianity works for you, amazing. If Buddhism works for you, amazing. If Islam, amazing. If if you're an atheist, amazing. I want to help you to love yourself in the vehicle that works for you. So I'm kind of giving, putting the cart before the horse here. But after getting to a point where I realized that my sexuality is a gift to be celebrated, not a burden to be tolerated, I decided to devote my life to helping other gay, bi, trans, queer people who identify as male to free themselves from that same sort of church shame, that perfectionism, that lack of confidence, that worrying about what people think of you, the the fear that it's wrong, the fear of sex, the shame around sex, the mm -hmm. lack of community. I mean, uh, the living small, right? The living in the closet, so many symptoms of shame. And so I have a 10 week program. That's exactly that. It's a built in, it, with the built in community, it's designed to help. Us queer men free themselves, uh, free ourselves from church shame. And uh, I also have a leadership program where clients who complete my 10-week program can continue to do the work. I always say the 10-week program teaches you how to swim, but the year-long program or sorry, the month-to-month -month ongoing leadership program teaches you how to be an Olympic athlete. Yeah. So I started that uh, about two and a half, three years ago. It's been met with tremendous success. I started my own podcast a month ago called The Great Unbecoming, stories of unlearning, of letting go of that which no longer serves you, which I'll have you on someday. And Which, which I, is, listener, viewer, it is awesome. It's really good. Uh -huh. to it. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. And and it's it's this job has been such a gift. I mean, I really feel so aligned with my purpose in ways mm -hmm. I've never have before. And I get to meet cool people like you. That's gotten me to this point of sitting in, as I was saying to you earlier, my newly decorated new apartment on Zoom, talking to a wonderful man halfway around the world. Yeah, yeah. And and I have to say, it is an awesome looking apartment, um, just from what I can see on this little um, boxy. Um, but there's so many things in there. And, and listener, if you are just sort of a, a, a plug for Eric's podcast, it is really good to hear his story in his words um struggling with wanting it to be perfect uh on his shitty first draft um yeah in uh in 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 episode one um and yeah i i also uh hate going back to my first episodes of both my podcasts and you just oh god it just feels like a year nine media assignment um and i wanted to resist I, well, I did resist the urge, but the urge was almost overwhelming to not sound like a radio, like a a, a morning. Um, like Isn't it FM, weird? It's FM wild. radio in in like the nineties. Yeah. Uh, it's just and, such a different beast. Yeah, yeah, 
And, yeah. and it's funny, you know, I don't, you, you were the loneliness guy. So I'm sure you felt this too. Like I'm certain we've talked, so I know your story too. Like you have felt lonely in your life, which has yeah. given, which has given you empathy and and a passion and a fire to help others to cope and to process their own loneliness. Right. So yeah. I've dealt with my own shame. I talk about people pleasing and perfectionism coming from a place of rooted in shame. Um, and that's because I have felt those things. And while I say I can make you free from shame, that's a lie. I can make you resilient to shame. I can give you tools to become resilient to shame. So when I started for context, um, listeners, when I started the podcast, I started my first episode, I, 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 with the pattern that I'm going with now, and we're only in the second month, so we'll see how this goes. But the pattern I'm going with now is the first episode of every month is a solo episode. And then there's going to be interviews the rest of the month. And so the first episode wasn't a solo, but the rest are interviews for the month. And I started, it was about five minutes in. I was like, no, 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 I got to start over. And I stopped recording and I was like, Eric, you will literally be here all day and all night if you keep doing that shit. <laughs> so don't. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I say this, but I, but I'll tell you, I, I might've said this in the episode. I'm like, this is take two and it's, and I'm record and I am recording, I'm completing and I am posting take two with no, I don't edit. Um, well, you know, I might edit at some point, but right now I, d I just slice the beginning and the end yeah. if there's dead space. But other than that, I don't edit because I don't want to give myself permission to try to do something I can't do, which is be perfect. The only way to get through something is to actually sit in the discomfort of it. So I guarantee the same, like I listened to the first episode and I was like, oh my God, what am I saying? It's uncomfortable. And that's the way it should be. Yeah. That's, that's the way to get through that shame and that discomfort and that it's perfectionism. Really it's really interesting. I do edit um, the beginning and the end of my episodes. Um, and for the Connection Espressos, I, I edit those mainly because I know that I have so much to say um, and so much to share that I could talk for a very long time. <laughs> and, you were a talker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh my, yes. Uh, and um, so some of the solo episodes that I've done of Connection Over Coffee, and the Connection Over Coffee is the longer form, and Connection Espresso is the the, the short one. And, and mm -hmm. ideally, I want to keep the Connection Espresso very short, sharp, snappy. So I do, like, I, I write a script. I read those because uh, I know that that's going to be, like, six, seven minutes. Um, here's a couple of, here's, here's something that I've noticed. Here's something that you've said to me. Here are two thoughts, two or three thoughts that, you know, give you a connection boost as you go about your day. That's that's sort of the tagline. This, like the long form, this is like having a chat, having a proper chat. And in a previous episode that's yet to go to air, I rail against um, uh, like this, this whole sort of culture of getting everything that we need um, in 15 second reels or, or, or like sorry 15 second stories 90 second reels and our attention span um you know and and want of the the fix has reduced to like what the the what social media allows us to to do within those confines however when it comes to loneliness and connection i'm kind of getting on the on my high horse here now and you know dusting off the soapbox but it is it's my podcast so I will but <laughs> critically like it takes time often takes time to wade into loneliness to expect that following someone on social media anyone on social media to expect that someone in in the first 30 seconds of meeting someone in real life is going to cure your loneliness like there's a whole lot of stuff there about you don't want your loneliness cured. You want it understood. Mm. Um, just in the same way that you don't want your hunger cured or your thirst cured. You want it understood. So next time you feel hungry, you eat something. When you next time you feel thirsty, you drink something. Next time you feel lonely, you connect. That's all it does. That's That's all it's meant to do. However, to expect that that, process can happen really quickly that's the height of unrealism that's that's really unrealistic setting ourselves up for failure and it takes time 
and the persistent application of time to let those connections develop organically. Mm. And if we're constantly rushing, all that kind of stuff. So I'm like completely fine with the longer form of my podcast going for an hour plus an hour because there is something magical that happens around the 40 to 50 minute mark, something completely unscripted. You will say something. I don't know you've got time pressures uh, at like bookending this. So, you know, but you will say something, Eric. That you you will go oh fuck wow I'd not th- I'd not thought of that where did that come from and that's the thing that like pivots all of this so want, you know, time is needed to actually feel that connection. I want to say something that was so profound that you mentioned something that you said that was so profound. You said when you're hungry you want to understand it so you can eat. When you are you know thirsty you want to understand so you can drink. Right. When you are lonely you want to understand it and then you said so that you can connect. Wow. I think that word connection is so important. And wow, does that tie into my work? Yeah. Yes. With gay, bi, trans men. Shame is the fear of disconnection. Mm -hmm. And the antidote to shame is connection. It's community. That's why there's Mm -hmm. a community aspect to my program. I, I will say we try to shortcut, right? We try to shortcut that discomfort of loneliness. Mm -hmm. We either shortcut it through the apps like social Mm -hmm. media Mm -hmm. or grinder or Mm -hmm. a hookup. And Mm -hmm. look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong in and of itself with a hookup with grinder with social media. I'm not saying in and of itself, I'm talking about the intention behind it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and yet a connection is so much takes so much more time and investment it's like if you and i are driving down the side of the road or driving down the road getting ready to go to a a really nice steak restaurant for a steak dinner and we see the golden arches mcdonald's on the side of the road we go "Ooh, we're hungry now let's do it because i don't want to wait till then Mm -hmm. you eat it it's quick Mm-hmm. It tastes really good. Those salty fries. Ooh, they're so good. Ooh, I don't know. There's something about a McDonald's Coke. I can't. It's so good. That terrible. It, it just, mm. Oh, it's so terrible. And it tastes so good. And then we're yeah. tired. And guess what? We're not hungry for that steak dinner. So yeah. we don't actually get the actual connection because we shortcut and, it. Yeah. Which like there's there's a whole lot of stuff that I say about this, but um, that that line, there's a couple of things about loneliness that I say is one is like we have to come out as as lonely in the same way because loneliness has power over us in the same way like you know our our sexuality has power over us before Mm -hmm. we come out and we get to own it so you have to own loneliness and and essentially come out at least to yourself as lonely um and then accept it with curiosity rather than judgment but also on top of that um you know when it comes to social media or whatever like there's content coming out over the next few weeks on this, so stay tuned. But it is all about how social media is not social. It's a tool for communication. It's not a tool for connection. Um, mm. And it's a terrible slave. It's a great slave, terrible master. And reaching for the phone when feeling lonely is like being adrift in a lifeboat and reaching over the side and uh, because you're thirsty and drinking salt water. It's like that's a good it, one. It feels like it's it's doing it, but it's actually doing you more harm. Um, mm-hmm. because social media doesn't want you to feel connected, it wants to give you that short hit of dopamine. So you keep on going back to it next time you feel those kind of pangs of of, of loneliness, of shame. And the other thing that I say as well in my course, Eric, is that. There is a troika. Uh, I did politics at uni, so I'm all about like troikas and, and, and tripartite agreements and things like that. But there's a troika between loneliness, shame, and trauma. Mm. Um, the like each of them, uh, I feel shame and trauma feeds loneliness. Loneliness and shame is a trauma. Uh, and like each one of them sort of where like have this little dance that's that's horrible. Um, which is why there is, you know, there's a reason why you're here for a second time Um, because there is, I really wanted to go deeper on this because I feel if it's not church shame, then it's going to be some other kind of shame. And, um, but 
odds are it is some kind of shame that has been installed in us because of um, uh, like religious principles that are simply in the water that we swim in, in the cultural water that we swim in. But I want to, there's a couple of things that I want to, before we get into that, and there's some really good questions that I've, that, that listener viewer that I've got for, for Eric. There's a couple of things here. One is um, I'm a language nerd, proudly, love language. And this still trips me up in Spanish, that there are two verbs to be. Mm-hmm. Right? One is a transient, ten, uh, a transient verb. So, you know, like, I am well. Estoy bien. And, but in five minutes' time, I might not be good. I might not be well. Mm. So my answer to that is I am not good, right? But then there is the permanent. So mm -hmm. the essence. Like, I am Phil, like soy Phil, soy Australiano. Um, and, you know, I'm like, I'm Australian. It's like permanent. I could get citizenship of another country, I guess. But, you know, that I wouldn't be Australian, but still I'd be Australian. Eric, what you what you were saying about, like, hoping that, you know, it, it, when you were, you know, in, in, you said, like, in the ninth grade, going to an evangelical church, realising that you were feeling a bit funny around boys, was it that you were, you know, wanting the gay to go from the permanence, like from Sea into Estar, into yes. like the temporary. Yes, God, it's so funny that you're using this metaphor. I used to be a Spanish teacher. I majored in Spanish and I wrote a paper, a philosophical paper on the difference between Sarah and Estar and about how that can help us to understand the difference between <laughs> our essence and our temporary placement. That's so funny and ironic that you're bringing this up right now i want to review that because i might want to do a solo episode on this i love yeah that. yeah 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 it's but I, you're right like, it 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 trips me up every time like yeah every well, it's, time I'm, it's such a good word. reminder so yes so at the time i was getting the two confused at the time i uh and this is why I say, like, I think I knew that I was different around puberty. I probably knew I was different earlier than that. But shame set in around puberty mm -hmm. when I started experiencing orgasms for the first time. And I would think of guys, I would be really, you know, we would say horny today. I would be very like, you know, almost like very analytic, very driven. And then you would expel like literally get it out of you, mm -hmm. have an orgasm. And then I wouldn't feel that way anymore. Yeah, And so I, I thought that I was not gay anymore. I thought I got it out of me, right? And I think, again, that's why I didn't come out because I was like, oh, it's it's something I can control until I met someone that made me feel it in my bones outside of an orgasm. That's when I shifted and changed and realized I can't change this. Uh, but yes, at the time, you know, Sarah, like, yo soy, I am, it's my essence. I am a man, soy hombre, right? I am a man, I am gay, right? Um we would use Sarah for that as permanence. Whereas mm. like a star would be used for like horny, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like horny is a feeling. It's a mood. It comes and goes. So things that come and go, no pun intended with coming yeah. or going, uh, we would use a star, but yes, at the time <laughs> I did get those confused. And I, and I definitely thought that being gay was like a mood. It was something that I could like get out of me. That's why I think people say like they have homosexual tendencies or they say they used to be gay or they left the gay lifestyle. It's like, mm. what is the gay, first of all, what, is the, what do you mean by gay lifestyle? Like we are not a monolith. We are all different. Not every gay man is sexually active. That doesn't mean they're any less or more gay than me or some of that other people that are sexually active. You can't get it out of you. Um, what a really, really good connection, Phil. I love that. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I, I I do this. I I, I listen to, to to the words. But another thing that that I wanted to just explore with you, Eric, is sort of in that telling of like in that that introduction. Um, there, you know, when the and 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 wanting to 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 expel the gay. Um, and you know, feeling feeling that um, that 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 release, and then sort of that sense of like normality. Um, and it's amazing, like you know, 
we we all know that feeling, don't we? Like you know, you you're horny, you come, uh, and then like you're just like, oh, okay, like how did I get here? Kind of moment. Um, right, and, right, right, know, right. It's almost back. like the lights come on, and it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like <clears throat> right. Better get back to how I'm like, a human. I forgot. I'm day. a human. I'm not an animal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I want to. I want to ask this question. On reflection, what role did, how did loneliness show up for you when you were still in the closet, still Mm. trying to control what you were thinking and feeling and and manage? Well, shame. Yeah, loneliness is a palace for shame. Shame just sets up camp there and it's like it's got squatters rights. And so shame will tell you in that moment of loneliness and that place of loneliness that you are alone and that no one else will understand what you're feeling. No one else has ever felt this way before. You are bad to feel it. You can't tell anyone about it and no one will understand and no one has ever been here before and no one will ever be here after you and you are an island. So I think shame and loneliness kind of feed one off off of each other when not cured. Um, So the other thing I was feeling was FOMO, which is, you know, again, fear of missing out. Like Mm. all these other people are happy and I'm not and I'll never be happy. And total disconnection, right? Like, I was, I always felt the safest around women. I think that's true for a lot of gay men. Mm -hmm. I felt the least safe around men. I'm trying to figure out if I felt less safe around gay men or straight men. That's a hard one. I think I different, I felt unsafe around different men for different reasons. Gay men, because I thought they, I thought I, Everyone knew gay men because I I was a f- more afraid they would know in a weird way I don't know but yeah. straight men I felt more threatened by because I felt the most dis- disconnected from straight men mm-hmm. because I knew I had nothing in common with them and I but but words weren't there now I feel very comfortable around straight men um, because they have nothing to hide yeah so yeah so disconnection fear of missing out the belief that I was alone and that no one else would understand this is really common not not fun not fun but not ha- not ha- healthy but normal yeah 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 and and one of the things that i say you know the 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 you know beyond you know drinking salt water when thirsty blah 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 those those kind of things one of these is um you know loneliness makes us feel like we're a broken human who is unworthy of love and belonging yeah however it makes us human and well, broken is such an interesting word you choose because shame is the fear that you are broken, the fear that you are disconnected, that you are not whole. Mm-hmm. Wholeheartedness, living a wholehearted life is an antidote to loneliness and shame. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason why the second, so my my tagline here for the loneliness guy is destigmatizing loneliness. So we destigmatize by talking about it and then helping um, gay men get feel authentic connection, which is wholehearted, living wholeheartedly. Um, yeah. So there's a couple of things in in this here, but I, I just wanted to sort of highlight elements there of of you know the the little bit of your story that you shared there, but the feeling the feeling like FOMO, shame. And um, that, you know, you're the only person ever in the history of the world to think and feel, think the thoughts, feel these feelings, uh, and no one could ever possibly understand. What that is to me is something that I see a lot. And listen, of you, here's an invitation for you. Because if you follow me on social media, you'll know that I, I say that loneliness turns you into like a world-class storyteller. Your loneliness can make two and two equal 17,000 in an absolute blink of an eye leap and have you believing that as an absolute certainty. Mm. 
that's at once, like there is comfort in your story because you can justify anything, but also there is misery in that story yeah. because that you're living a falsehood. It is not right. true. Right. So when we are wrestling with thoughts and feelings of loneliness and viewer, listener, this could be you right now. I dare say this is you right now. It takes so much courage. It takes so much effort. It takes a lot of self-love. It takes a lot of, fuck this. I I am worthy of more than these thoughts and feelings. And I can say- Do you know how many- mm -hmm. Sorry. No, I was so I was going to interrupt you. I just want to say real quick, do you know how many people I talk to on a daily basis that feel they're alone? Yeah. That feel they're the only ones that don't feel as if they belong in the gay community? Mm -hmm. I, I want to get all, well, I do get all of these people together through my program, but people that don't do the program, I want to get them all together and be like, look at, look around you. Everyone in this room feels the exact same way. Yeah. Meet each other. Yes. Connect. Yes. 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 And um, yeah, like if I, it is so common. It is so common. But I want to say it take like, it takes so much courage to take a step to go, no, this is not like, this is like, I'm worthy of more. I can say it until I'm blue in the face. Eric can say it until he's blue in the face that, you know, you're worthy, take a step. Like the first step is the, the only one that you take alone. But after that, like there are so many services, so many services around you that can help you like right next to you take some steps to help you towards the connection that you have been looking for in the way that you do. Speak to a lot of the people on the podcast who I think are awesome. Eric's back for a second go. Um, you know, like there is a reason. But like this is a, this is a call to action and, and an unscripted, unprompted one. You can read all the blogs, you can read all the books, you can listen to the podcasts, you can even listen to this podcast, you can listen to Eric's awesome podcast. You can listen to, I don't know, the Dalai Lama. You can do all of this kind of stuff. But at the end of all of this, there's like the one thing that you need to do is the doing, mm. is your doing. And gathering information is seductive because it, it's, it's doing. But it's not the doing that needs to get done um, for, for, for you to move past your loneliness. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll yeah, get off my Fascinating. So yeah, yeah, it's a it's an element of procrastinating. It's it's masturbation. It feels like the real thing. Oh yeah. Um, and it can feel good. Um, but yeah, there's 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 other ways there too. Eric, how does how does going specifically to your work? How does religious shame affect lives? Mm. How does religious shame affect lives? Well, I'll, I'll I'll say religious shame is shame. You know, I don't think it has to be specifically religious shame, but I do think that religious shame really oftentimes um, amplifies it and raises the stakes because religious shame will tell you that not only are you bad, but you're also going to burn in the fiery pits of hell for eternity. That those stakes are pretty pretty damn high. Yeah. Um. So how does it affect people? Oh my gosh. I mean, like I said earlier, it affects your, your ability to connect. Um, perfectionism is a tool that we use to, to look and act perfectly, quote unquote, perfectly in order to avoid the intolerable belief that we're, that we're not good and that we're not perfect. And so things like perfectionism are shields. They, they keep us disconnected because people aren't appreciating us for us they're appreciating us for what we're doing for our actions mm. um and we're not called human doings though we're called human beings right and so we develop this sort of idea of conditional love you know if i do this then i will be approved of you know if i marry a woman then i will fit into society um if i if i act masculine if i pray 
uh, you know, if I pray, then I'll be changed, right? If we do these things, and if you don't, and if those things happen, and again, the church so often impresses upon us the importance of perfectionism, right? You have, and yet they also call us sinners, you know, you have to do these things. And if you're not, if you're, if you're still gay, it looks like you're not trying hard enough. Yes. It looks like you're not praying hard enough. Um, and it's manipulative and it's, it's, it's what I call Christian gaslighting, mm. Christian gaslight topics. And this is going to be another episode of my podcast are, uh, things like, yeah, you just got to read the Bible. You haven't read the Bible enough or the Bible does say, or, um, you know, hate the sin, not the sinner. It's where they purge their assholery onto us, but then they hide behind the shield of the Bible yeah. of, of what a book said out of context. And so how does it affect us? It makes us feel like we're bad. Uh, and, and the church is really good at it, right? The church uh, is a business. They follow the typical marketing strategy of problem, agitate, solve. Watch any commercial, any copy has problem, agitate, solve. Here's the problem and here's how bad the problem is. I got a solution for you, buy, buy this product. That's every commercial ever, right? Mm -hmm. So with the church problem, you're a sinner. I don't hate you, but you are. But the Bible says, you know, it's not my fault. So they're hiding behind the, they're, you know, they're purging their ass holy around to us. They're avoiding accountability and using the, the Bible as a shield. And they're really pressing the thumb and the bruise of that problem. You're a sinner. Agitate. Not only are you a sinner, but I'm going to agitate it by telling you that you're going to burn in hell. That's how bad this is. Mm -hmm. Here's the solution. Come to this church sit in these pews. You can't be in a leadership position because you're gay and that's a sinful life, but give us money and we'll tell you that you need to pray and you need to do X, Y, and Z. And maybe, maybe you'll be, if, if you pray hard enough, if you do all the heavy lifting, then you will be, the problem will be solved. Here's the problem when, here's the problem when the problem uh, leans into perfectionism. The problem is never solved. Yes. Because there's nothing to solve because you're, perfectly imperfect. And that's why places like conversion therapy camps, which are illegal in some states, but still very legal in many others, are uh, so successful and not successful. Like, it's a great business model. They get money, but they don't do anything. They have a 0% success rate. <laughs> they blame you for it. And that gets you to continue to come back. So that shame will tell you, well, I got to keep going back to this place because they told me I need them and I want to please them. And I want, I got to do all of these things. I must not have done those things enough. Instead of recognizing that you're good as you are, pause, breathe. You will never be perfect. So stop trying. There is no, you'll never be perfect because there is no perfect. Yeah. And I think that when we use Jesus instead of as a weapon against queer community, as a human being to look up to, not to look up to, but well, sure to look up to, but to follow. I say look up to, but I don't mean to worship. Jesus never said, worship me. Jesus said, follow me. Big difference. Mm. When we worship Jesus, we dehumanize him. We put him on a pedestal. Jesus didn't say, worship me, put me above here. Jesus said, raise your consciousness to my level. Recognize that we are all flawed and we are all beautiful in our flaws. I'm using the word flaw very loosely. There's nothing flawed about being gay. Um, and 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 raise your consciousness to my level. But we didn't do that. Instead, we pushed him above us. We said, that's hard. That's intolerable. So we're going to worship you instead. Mm. Jesus never wanted a religion named after him. <laughs> he didn't want a religion. He didn't ask for that. Um, but again, it, it, it's tied to politics. It's tied to power. It's tied to white supremacy. And it's tied to that cult of innocence, taking innocent people and making them believe that they are imperfect and that they need the system. What's the difference between a small religion and a big religion? The word and a, a small unpopular religion and a big popular religion is the word cult, mm. right? That's literally the difference, right? Like people will say like whites, uh, you know, people will say like Scientology, oh, that's a cult. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's the same, but it is the same as some some form. I'm not saying I, I still go to church. I'm not saying all churches are like this, but my goodness, are there some culty Christian churches out there? Um, so, so, so they use the tool of shame to just, to destroy our self-esteem, our confidence. 
and um, get us to believe that we absolutely need them and we need specifically that church, right? Yeah. Some Catholics believe if you're not Catholic, you're going to hell. Some Christians believe if you're not Christian, you're going to hell. Some Muslims believe if you're not Muslim, you're going to hell. There are like how many thousands of different gods right now? Like, how do we know that this one is the right one, mm -hmm. right? Well, we don't, but we're at very young children. We're going to teach people this is the way, the truth, and the light. And if you don't believe this, then you're sinning. So continue to have faith like a child. And that means don't question. Keep your head down. Don't question. Do the work. If you're not, then you're the problem. And again, it's that vicious cycle of problem agitate solve. There's a couple of things here. You, you've, first of all, brilliant. Uh, and listener, if you are, this is the reason why I ask Eric um, back on. You've use the words cult of innocence. For the listener viewer, you've used it a few times. For the listener viewer who is not sort of familiar with this term, can you describe it for us? Yeah, sure. So when I say cult of innocence, this is what it means to me. People have their, might have their own definitions, but to me, I think the word cult and innocence are important. Cult is is it's loosely what a cult is very loosely is a group with a leader that tells you how to be how to act how to behave and if you don't then these are the consequences right and i say innocent because i think that a lot of people don't understand that they have been bought into the cult of innocence mm -hmm. they don't recognize that they are doing a lot of harm a lot of harm uh, a, a large disproportionate I think in the United States, there's somewhere between like 1.6 and 2.2 million homeless youth, youth, children under 18. And an, a large percent of that, of the, of the youth, the homeless youth are queer, are gay. And a large percent of those people have been kicked out of religious households in the name of what God Because mm. my God tells me that we, the God, God is synonymous with love. And we're here to love. But these parents think that they are loving their children by kicking them out of their houses. So I don't know if that person's part of the cult of innocence because that's not a very innocent act. That's a pretty violent act to kick your child out of your house. But a more of a, a more quote unquote cult of innocent act might be, hey, listen, I love you, but the Bible says this. I just want what's best for you. I genuinely believe that could come from a good place. They do say that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I'm just going to pray for you. I think that has good intention. I don't want you to go to hell, so I'm going to pray for you. I think that has good intentions. But what you don't understand is that that is so demoralizing. That is so dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. And when you use the Bible to cite the Bible, to say that the Bible is correct because the Bible says the Bible is correct, you are in the cult of innocence. You don't recognize the difference between fact and belief. And, and and with some people, you cannot get it through their head. And I will respond when they give me Leviticus 18.22, thou shalt not lie with another man. I think that's that verse. And I say, that is your belief. No, it's not my belief. It's the word of God. But you believe that the Bible is the word of God. It's because it is the word of God. That's a fact. That is not a fact mm. that is literally not a definition of a fact. That is a def that is your belief. And it is so dangerous because they are wrong, period. I, I can, I go back and forth on this, but like if you think that homosexuality is wrong, fine, fine. But it's not your place to impress those beliefs, dangerous beliefs under other people. And they would say, oh, but it is. Oh, but it is. And that's where evangelical evangelism got it all wrong. And, and this goes back in history when, when far-right fundamentalist Christians uh, uh, started to control the far-right conservative movement and got into politics. It, 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 and now don't get me started on politics today, but... <laughs> It is coming from it comes from a place of power. Those are those cult leaders. It comes from a place of power. But the followers, they really genuinely think they're doing something right. They really do think that they're doing the will of God. The number of people that say, Hey man, I love you. I'm not judging you. 
but homosexuality uh, is wrong. How, 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 how can you tell me that you're not judging me? Did you just hear what came out? But that's, that's not my belief. That's a fact. Oh my God. And there's no getting around it. Mm -hmm. So don't even try. What do they say about honey versus shit? They say, um, bees don't waste their time explaining to flies why honey is better than shit. Don't try. Don't try. It won't work. So that's the cult of innocence. It's genuinely believing that you're doing good. And then we look at, you know, the gay teens are five times, almost five times more likely to attempt suicide than straight teens. Maybe it's because we're telling them that they're bad and yeah. we're telling them they have to do X, Y, and Z. And then they do X, Y, and Z. And it still doesn't do anything because it shouldn't because you were made this way. It's asinine and it's, it's the cult of innocence. I love the the expression of it. Um, and I, as you were speaking, I was reminded of, I think it was a Brene Brown episode where she spoke to Father Richard Rohr. I love Richard Rohr. The Universal yeah. Christ is one of my favorite books. I, I'm going to defer to you as the expert on this, but um, I was fortunate, uh, very fortunate, very privileged to go to Catholic schools. I was raised Catholic um, and went through uh, like primary school uh, run by, by by an order of nuns, um, went to a Catholic school run by the Marist brothers. I think you say Marist, um, but Marist brothers. Um, and each of those impressed upon me the need to be of service, mm. uh, to use privilege, to be of service. Um, and then at university, I lived at a residential college, um, sort of sort of in the Oxford tradition, um, run by the Jesuits. And the Jesuits were simply awesome. That is like, we don't care how you pray, mm -hmm. um, but we want you to like put what you have, what you're learning here into service. And that was just like, I'm extremely grateful for that. And, you know, cha essentially challenge everything. There is no status quo that cannot be, that 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 is not above reproach. Yeah. Um, and Which is the definition of faith, or my definition of faith is challenge and question everything. Those cult people in the cult of innocence, the followers and the cult leaders will tell you far-right fundamentalist Christians, and not just Christian, there are other religions that are like this too, don't get me wrong, will, will tell you, have faith like a child. If you question, then you don't have faith. That that faith is certainty. Faith is not certainty, no. but they want you to believe that. Faith is sitting in the discomfort of the unknown and choosing to question, challenge, and love anyway. And and it's that last point there, which is really important because these are big things. We need to go kindly on ourselves and each other. But second, but the the the, the thing that I love about Richard Raw, he he like listening to him. I was just like listening to, you know, sitting around the dinner table. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the, the Jesuits also like, you know, um, Holy Cross, uh, Georgetown, Boston college, um, and, and those kind of places in, in the U S really kind of, you know, being with the students. Uh, and so I, you know, would, would be having breakfast with, you know, sitting around with some friends and a priest. Uh, and, you know, the priest would just be like, you know, just sort of sitting there being a normal person kind of thing. And, but had this very great way of like, sort of really sort of doing coaching, really, like, like asking open-ended questions, but why, but why, but why do you think that? Why do you think that? Why do you think that? I'm not going to tell you yeah, why. I I'm love thinking. the question why, yes. And I'm not going to like say, this is it. Um, and, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, my my encyclopedic knowledge of the Good News Bible tells me this. However, mm. one of the things that I loved about Richard Rohr, and this really reminded me of, of, of my experience, but the cult of innocence was like having a relationship to God like a child has to Santa. Mm. Um, and yeah, you better uh, watch out. <laughs> yeah, knows he's, he's you're watching away, you. Knows he knows you're when you're freaking weirdo creep. Yep. What, a, what a weird thing to say to children, by the way. He knows yeah. when you're awake. He knows when you're asleep. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Cause he's watching you do, 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 I'm do. Still, I'm a 46 year old man. When I go like shopping around Christmas, I will actively avoid seeing Santa 
um, <laughs> like a whole lot of trauma. <laughs> like one of my uncles used to dress up as Santa and I used to think it was really freaky that Santa knew my name. Um, <laughs> uh, but but you're so right. I mean, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. I see where can, can, I won't interrupt again. I'm excited. No, no, God, interrupt, please. Well, I was just gonna say, I think I know where you're going with this, but I'll I'll, I'll let you know if, if once you get there. Yeah, okay. Um, it is like, I feel that they're like, it's complicated. There is no certainty in any of this. They, and and I get deeply suspicious of anyone who says, as as you know, you, you just said there, Eric, you know, I'm the way, the truth and the life. Like, this is it. This is it. Like, there is no other way of being human. There is no other way of being a good human rather than being exactly like this. And I feel, you know, it, 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 I don't know where I'm going with this, but I just really do feel like, you know, we, we get to, we get to have our own relationship with ourselves and with something outside of us, whether that is other humans, whether that is nature, whether that is the universe, whether that is whatever, in a way that, you know, calls us forward, not calls us out. Well, yes, and yes, and I love, the, the, I'm still thinking about that comparison with Santa and children and God, mm. the cartoon version of God and 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 Christians, as an, some Christians as an example. Think about it. We tell children that there is this large man in a white beard that's going to cross your name off once a year, and if you were good, you're going to get toys, and if you were not, you're going to get coal. Well, first of all, think about the kids whose parents don't have the financial resources. Does that mean that those kids are, are bad? Again, cult of innocence. I'm not saying parents mean this. I'm not, unless I'm not trying to be hard on parents right now either, but but it, it's a definitely flawed system, right? Yeah. So it, it, it's saying like, you will receive these things if you are good. It it really it really uh, conditions that uh, that that sort of conditional love. Is that, did I say that right? Yeah. It, 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 it practices that sort of, pushes that sort of narrative that you have the, if this, then that, if I am this way, then I will get this. Right. So that's what we're teaching children. And then as adults, yes, same with God. If you do this, then you will be good. If you're not, you will not just get coal. You will burn in hell forever. So yeah, yeah. same thing. And um, as opposed to teaching children to be good, cause it feels good and be good because love needs no reason. Yeah. And to be good because you want to treat others the way you want them to treat you right? Not, I want to be good so that I get these things. And, and you hear the threats of parents like, Santa's watching you. Are you going to be good? Have you been a good little boy this year? Are you going to get I'm toys because it. you've been good? Yep. Yep. It's yep. the exact same thing. It's a very powerful compliance tool when you've got uh, twin toddlers mm -hmm. who are very excited in the weeks before Christmas. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, like it, it doesn't, it's not without cost. Um Keeping an eye on the time here, Eric, what are three, like one, two, three steps that the listener viewer can do if they are real, if, if suddenly like um, Paul on the road to Damascus, your wit and insight, your, your, um, your, your absolute wisdom has had them have an epiphany scales have fallen from their eyes um and they are they are hearing clearly they are seeing clearly clearer what are what are some of the things that someone could do right now to begin uh i want to say reframing i want to, i was going to say healing uh church shame but sort of accepting you know i'll leave it like what are three things that yeah. someone can do yeah so my program is based on five steps i'll give you the first three and if anyone wants all five you can reach out to me i'm on instagram e-r-i-c-f-e-l-t-e-s eric feltis you can email me eric at lifecoachingbyfeltis.com go to my website lifecoachingbyfeltis.com reach out to me and i'd be happy to give you the video that that talks about these five steps the first one is Noting the beliefs holding you back. 
Note the beliefs holding you back with a curious mind. Just note them. Wow, I feel like being gay is wrong. Or I feel like I have to please other people. Or when I hear a lot, I feel like I'm not enough. Or I'm bad. Or being mm -hmm. gay is bad. Whatever the thought is, just note the beliefs. Just note them. That's it. Note them. Step two, question and challenge those beliefs. I feel... I will never meet, I am not worth, oh, there's so many in my head right now. I'm not worthy mm -hmm. of love, right? Or I am bad or being gay is bad, whatever. Or I'll never meet a partner or I'll never have the courage to come out. Is it true? Yeah, it's true. I just said it. I feel it. It's true. Can you say with 100% certainty it's true? Okay, I guess I can't prove that it's true. That second question really opens the door mm -hmm. because you realize, huh, Maybe it's not true. Okay, I'll entertain. You're not just saying you're wrong to feel that way. You're really just, you're questioning it. So we say questioning beliefs. Question the beliefs. My next question would be, who, who are you with that thought? How do you treat yourself with that thought? Pretty poorly. Uh, I get this, this knot in my stomach. Uh, I shut myself off. If I think I'll never find a partner and I believe that I'll never find a partner, then I'm really just proving my ego right and my ego kind of wants to be right your ego doesn't want you to be happy it wants to be right mm. my last question for you to be who would you be without that thought oh my god if i didn't believe that i'll never meet a partner if i didn't believe that being gay is bad i'd be able to breathe for the first time i would be limitless i'd be unstoppable i'd be happy so just journal on those questions question those beliefs holding you back and then the third step is adopting a more empowering belief. So ask yourself, is there a more empowering belief other than I'll never my, I'll never meet my partner? Or is there a more empowering belief than being gay is wrong? Maybe the belief is being gay is a gift. Play with it. Play with that idea. Live that, right? Now, the program with my help can kind of guide you, hold you accountable, give you, I mean, those are just, that's a drop in the bucket compared to what we do together. Plus, when you have the, the community, which is antidote for disconnection, a community is, is a container for belonging. Mm. So you need that community as well to, to practice this. But those, in a nutshell, that is the foundation of the program. Questioning, noting your beliefs, questioning your beliefs, changing your beliefs. Um, that sounds awesome. Even as you were speaking and I was writing them down for, you know, for, to, you know, to, to keep in mind and like come back to these as quotes for, for the Byron uh, Katie, by the way, I have to reference Byron Katie. She came up with those questions. Sometimes I, sometimes I put them in my own words, but I would reach out to me. You can also look up Byron Katie's books. I want to say it's called the four questions. Yeah. Those questions are great. They are there are really other thoughts on trial activities. That's just one. That's an easy one to kind of spout off. That's really, really helpful because they are, let's not, well, I don't want to ever underestimate the courage that it takes to even get to step one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, listener, viewer, my suggestion, whether it's, you know, um, church-based shame, whether it's loneliness, whether it's like any other kind of discomfort in your life, go gently on yourself because, you know, it does take courage to begin the process of accepting what is. Yeah. To move from like the, the transient verb to be to the permanent, the essence of to be, and it can feel really scary. Yeah. So I want to simply say, go kindly on yourself right now. Mm, Please yes, do geez. reach out to, to, to Eric, reach out to me. There's going to be links in the episode description so you can contact Eric. Um, and yeah, just please go really gently with a fuck ton of self-love. Mm, really well said and good reminder. Choose grace and curiosity. Yeah. Not grace and curiosity, not judgment and certainty. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic way to end this chat, Eric. Yeah, um, cheers. We could, we could chat for absolute hours. We um, could. 
But uh, I wanted to say thank you once again for joining us for Connection Over Coffee um, and just cannot wait to see how you go with future episodes of your podcast, but also helping individual gay, uh, gay, bi, trans men um, help, like, oh my God, like, I want to say something, but it sounds very cliche, but like realizing that they are, that they are the divine really mm, amen beautiful well said thank you so much eric we'll catch up with you i'm sure for a third time thanks for having me it's been a pleasure it always is thank you youtube you're awesome we'll catch up with you next time be sure to uh yell out to eric um nicely um <laughs> the link in the episode descriptions are going to be uh in the the link to eric are in the episode descriptions there we go. I talk English good. Yeah. <laughs>